Take Back Your Health Now, Episode 83. You're listening to the Take Back Your Health Now podcast, the show that interviews the top doctors, athletes, trainers, and entrepreneurs to help you find the holy grail of health. Now here's your host, Dr. Dan Margolin. Hi, this is Dr. Dan Margolin with another segment of Take Back Your Health Now, where we pull out all the stops in search of health's holy grail. We're excited. We have Dr. Sachin Patel. He is a DCN, is a guardian of truth and a warrior of light. His superpower is taking complex ideas and distilling them down to their essence with easy to understand analogies. Uh, Sachin uses this gift to help transform the lives of thousands of people around the world through his organization, the Living Proof Institute. Uh, Sachin founded the Living Proof Institute as part of his own personal transformation. When he couldn't find answers through conventional medicine, he began to explore functional and lifestyle medicine, and it dramatically changed his life. Dr. Patel, how are you, sir? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, we're, we're real excited to have you on board. Now, I was, you know, I just one of your sayings that the doctor of the future is the patient. I love that. I really love that. Could you just expand on that and then just give us a little bit of your history, how you got started, and uh, and we'll go from there. Sure. So I guess this is a new concept for a lot of people because they're always looking for a new doctor, but the greatest doctor is the doctor within. So we believe that the, you know, the doctor of the future is the patient, community is the nurse, and nature is the pharmacy. So everything that we need is available very readily to us but we have to be looking in the right places. And I think most people these days are looking in the wrong places for health. And our message is to just get people looking in the right places. And once you do, you'll find a almost free, completely natural, uh, symbiotic healing tool uh, in your self, in your community, and in nature. You know what I find backs that up. I was doing a lot. At one point, I was really uh, studying up on different plant life and things like that. And you, What you find in nature is that if there's a plant that causes a disease, almost right next to it is another plant that cures that disease. And an example is like poison ivy, and I forget the other plant, that it's like an aloe plant that you would put on that. Is that what you also find? You know, nature creates every solution that we need. And sometimes it's not even the plants, it's just being in nature. I think that's incredibly healing. It's amazing uh, that when we can shift our physiology to match that of nature's, nature is in a constant state of growth as well. It's a constant state of shedding. Uh, you know, new, new opportunities are constantly arising in nature. So I think nature is, an, is the perfect metaphor uh, for life in general. And I think that, you know, it's perfectly fitting that we might find the cure next to the poison because it just goes to show us that the tools that we need are readily available. We just have to look in the right places. Now, how did you how did you come to this realization? Is this something you inherently always knew, or was there a point where you just sort of woke up and said, "Hey, wait a minute, I'm going to shift away from"? Because this is not your average medical thought, right? The the average medical thought process is a there's a disease and there's a pill for it, and uh, you're sort of on the uh, uh, the other side of the spectrum, if you would. How did how did you come up with this viewpoint? Well, I think it it really started for me in 2006 when I was on the news as a as a chiropractor, my focus was sports, and I thought I had my perfect job. I was working in a sports-based clinic, and I landed a spot on the TV uh, 5 o'clock news, and I thought that that was going to be what catapulted my practice as an associate into the future. And it turns out that a bunch of people called in who had no business being in my office. They were very sick, very ill, so I went from treating marathon runners Olympic athletes, professional athletes, to seeing some of the sickest people in my community. And it was really gut-wrenching because I couldn't really help them. I had no training in them in that field of care. And and after doing the intakes and asking questions, I realized that the people that they were seeing, the medical specialists, didn't have any idea how to help them either. So I didn't feel so bad about myself, but I felt bad about the patients because I didn't know where to send them. And, you know, I started learning about functional medicine through case studies that I was getting through emails from who would later become my mentor, Dr. Ron Grisanti. And I, you know, I, I started taking the training and it helped me tremendously. And through the training, I was able to uh, get a hold of a questionnaire that we would give to our patients. And I started giving it to my chiropractic patients and started realizing that many of them had chronic illnesses and diseases 
that were not being remedied by conventional medicine, but they never brought them to my attention because our intake form didn't even ask them those type of questions. So I quickly realized that there was millions of millions of people suffering and they weren't going to find answers in conventional medicine. My wife, who's a pharmacist, will tell you the same thing, you know, and one of the things is that we have to reframe what we, how we define diseases. You know, diseases are basically names that we give adaptive physiology. And so as a, as a chiropractor who believes in vitalistic care, who believes that the body can heal itself, I had to start asking a different set of questions. And I started asking questions that were more in line with the, the chiropractic philosophy, the, the vitalistic philosophy, which is, you know, the body can heal itself. The body knows nothing but how to heal itself. We just have to provide it with the right environment. We have to provide it with the right thought processes, the right food, you know, the right amount of movement and the body regenerates and takes care of itself. But that, you know, that's typically not being done in even a lot of chiropractic offices because most people are just managing musculoskeletal problems or you know, they're referring out for quote unquote diseases. And I believe that the body's intelligent and disease as we define it is just intelligent adaptation to you know, bad choices or bad circumstances or bad environments that we're in. I understand. Well, let me ask, that, that brings to the question. There's two things that you talk about, functional medicine and lifestyle medicine. So what what is functional medicine? What is lifestyle medicine? Just define those for me. Sure, great question. So functional medicine, as I define it, is basically root cause analysis and using uh, you know strategic forms and by asking the right questions, we can usually identify what the underlying mechanism is. Sometimes it's emotional trauma, sometimes it's environmental issues like mold, uh, sometimes it could be environmental stressors like our workplace. Uh, that's caught, that's wreaking havoc on our what's called our HPA axis. It could also be nutrient deficiencies or it could be stealth infections. So functional medicine uses basically a thorough intake process and communication process with the patient, listens to the patient and identifies where these problems might be coming from. And then using innovative lab testing that looks at function instead of disease, we're able to identify it and hone in on exactly what's going on. Now, Lifestyle medicine is where the patient comes into it. And I believe that lifestyle medicine is 80% of the equation and functional medicine is 20% of the equation because the patient ultimately has to do the work. And so the way they live their life, the people they hang out with, uh, the situations they put themselves in, the food choices that they make, you know, our subconscious programming, all of those things are basically what determine our lifestyle choices. And when we provide the right lifestyle and right environment, our body does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is heal instead of constantly adapting. And this adaptation to toxic environments is what we define as disease. So, so just makes I'm just trying to just define it a little bit for myself. So, functional medicine, like I know, um, one of the things that's used there's a thing called the JTEC uh, uh, functional evaluation to determine range of motion. Right, if there's any lack of functional range of motion as compared to whatever the standards are from the AMA. So that's sort of a functional test, right? And there's other testing, obviously. And then lifestyle medicine is like, hey, when you're at home, what are the choices that you're making? It's really helping them adapt to what meals they're making, how much exercise they're doing. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit more clarity because the word functional is pretty ambiguous. And I, I know it can be confusing depending on what arena you're using it in. So functional medicine as, as the type of function that I'm referring to is more about cell function. And so we're looking at things like the mitochondria, we're looking at liver uh, detoxification pathways, we're looking at oxidative stress, we're looking at markers of deficiency such as vitamin D deficiency, we're looking at stool markers to see is there a stealth infection that's causing chronic inflammation in the gut. We might do testing on intestinal permeability or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We might even look at things like the blood-brain barrier. So we're looking at how intact is the chemistry of the body and how intact is the hormonal axis in the body, how intact are you know, the membranes in the body, such as the GI lining and the blood brain barrier, because these are important um, indicators of uh, somebody's overall health and wellness. We pay a lot of attention to the mitochondria. The mitochondria is, for those of you that don't know, is the little workhorses, little engines inside of our cells that do a lot of the work for us. And they turn our food into and oxygen into something called ATP. So in order for someone to heal and to function properly, we need adequate energy production. So we're doing tests like urine tests, stool tests, saliva tests, breath tests uh, to figure out what's going on internally, the things that we can't see and the things that are often not measured in traditional uh, medicine. 
where I tell you, I totally had misunderstood words in functional medicine. I was totally thinking something different. So thank you for clarifying. And I've interviewed people on this subject, and I didn't completely get it until you just made that very clear. I was, for some reason, I'm thinking functional medicine is like some lack of function, whether it be joint motion and, you know, being a chiropractor, I thought that, you know, that would be an area that you were going. So totally, you totally like changed my viewpoint. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I, I actually don't like that term functional medicine because it can be pretty ambiguous. And another thing too is like there's functional neurology as well, which is a, a whole different can of worms. But, you know, the word functional can be a little bit confusing. So I appreciate you clarifying that. Yeah. So um, so you, you said the name of your mentor and just explain how, what was your mentor's name again? Dr. Ron Grisanti. Dr. Ron Grisanti. So Dr. Grisanti, he, is he the one that founded this concept of functional medicine or he just took different tools of it? Like how, explain to us how this whole thing evolved because it's not something I'm very, I'm not very aware of it. Yeah, sure. So functional medicine, I guess in its grassroots form was founded by Jeffrey Bland. And Jeffrey Bland is probably late. He's he's uh, hailed as the father of functional medicine. So he actually coined the term. It's been around for a couple decades now, and basically it's systems biology. It's it's understanding how the different systems in our body are all interconnected, and how they impact one another. Because the same blood goes everywhere. So it's really, in my opinion, almost impossible to develop any disease in isolation. The only thing we develop in isolation is a broken arm, right? Or if we have like right, an right, acute right. trauma. Everything else is is usually developed by uh, a breakdown in the systems in our body, and it impacts every system in our body because, again, the same blood, the same hormones go to every tissue in our in our body, and which means that if we can tap into that understanding, then we can heal everything at the same time, just like we can destroy everything at the same time with toxic blood or nutrient deficiencies or you know mold or heavy metals. We can heal everything at the same time if we remove the things that are interfering with our best health and add the things in that are missing. Well, now when, when somebody comes to you for uh, a typical evaluation, right, work us through how that would go and what are the basic tests that you would order almost on everybody, right, if there is such a thing. Sure, yeah, no, great question. So we start with a thorough evaluation um, of their mindset because there's three core values that we have in our practice. Uh, the first one is that we don't treat any diseases, but we help our patients co-create health. The second one is that virtually all disease starts in the gut. Uh, and then the third one is that the patient ultimately determines the outcome. So we really have to have a committed patient uh, to work through this process because it is a lot of work. I mean, we're doing some pretty deep work. We're going all the way back to their childhood. We're reprogramming their subconscious mind. We're working on their diet and nutrition. We're working on their environments. We're working on their relationships. So first things first is we have to qualify the patient to make sure that this person is ready to go uh, deep and do the work that's required to live their best life. So it starts with a quick phone call. That's absolutely free. And this is a way for us to hear somebody's story uh, in a non-clinical way, but more in a, in a, a readiness type of assessment that we do. And then if the person decides that this is the right next step for them, then we have them come in for an initial consultation. That consultation starts with them filling out a 45 page intake form. And this intake form uh, addresses those things that I talked about earlier. And it, it looks at them not just from a clinical perspective, but it looks at them as a human being. So we go into their uh, childhood, we go into uh, their dental health, we go into their digestive health, their nutrition, we look at their relationships, we evaluate their communication style, we look at their vocation, are they doing something that they're passionate about for a living? Because all of these things play a role in whether or not they're going to live their best life or not. And then from there, we recommend testing, and it's individualized, but there's some tests that we do on every patient, which I think is worth mentioning. The first one is called an organic acid test. An organic acid test is done by collecting uh, your first morning void uh, of your urine. So by collecting a urine sample in the morning, we can look at the waste products that are produced by your chemical processes in your body. There's nine specific systems that we look at. The first one is fat metabolism. We look at carbohydrate metabolism. We look at mitochondrial function. We look at liver detoxification. We look at oxidative stress. We look at neurotransmitter. 
uh, function. We look at B vitamin status, and we look at markers for healthy uh, bacterial growth or toxic bacterial growth in the digestive system. So those nine markers give us a pretty good indication as far as what's going on at a cellular level uh, with that patient. And it, in, in some cases, it kind of looks at their organs and organelles to see if they're functioning properly. The other test that we do is a stool co collection. So by providing a stool sample, we're able to take a look into the patient's digestive function. We can see how effectively they're digesting fats, how effectively they're digesting carbohydrates and proteins. We can also see if they have stealth infections uh, that haven't been identified. And stealth infections are just that, they're stealth, which means most people don't even know they have them. But these chronic infections can really bog down the immune system. They can also create chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is a driver for really many, many diseases, and there are cro uh, chronic stress on the body as well. So most people have stress that they know of, but some people, a lot of people actually have stress that they're unaware of, and usually that stress is that chronic stealth infection that they have. So wow. those two tests are, are tests that we typically do, and then in many cases, we're gonna find hormonal imbalances. So we'll take a look at that patient's uh, hormone axis. So we'll look at um, you know, a, a, a urine sample, which will tell us about their ability to manufacture hormones, and how well those hormones are eliminated from their system as well. So it, it's pretty in depth. And when we have all this information, uh, what we do is we then help the patient by navigating what the next best steps are. In our practice, we have uh, a second appointment that is, is typically what we call the anti-supplement appointment. It's our nutrition and lifestyle consultation. So we try to minimize the number of pills that people need by changing their lifestyle and their behaviors by getting them to eat eat the right foods, but also make sure they're chewing those foods and digesting those foods appropriately. We get people to start uh, also looking at their um, subconscious programming. So we have a hypnotherapist on staff and an NLP coach. And what that uh, Jillian will do is she'll help people in resetting their operating system. Our operating system was programmed for us between the age of zero and seven, and usually by circumstances that our parents were under. So many of us will have a belief system that's not serving us anymore, and we essentially become our parents. As much as some of us hate to admit that, we become our parents because our parents, um, or whoever raised us between the age of zero and seven, uh, shaped, our, uh, shaped the way we think the world works. And that's not always the case, especially I know a lot of people listening to this might have immigrants for parents. And so they may have grown up in a very scarcity type of mindset. They may have grown up in an environment where resting and taking care of yourself was not honored. It was actually ridiculed or put down. So, you know, looking at that childhood uh, programming can be very, very critical because if we don't change the programming, if we don't change the subconscious mind, it's almost impossible to change long term behavior. Well, it is. Yeah, I would. I would. I totally agree that um, you know your viewpoint really does determine uh, both your physical state and how well you do in life, whether you're happy or not. I mean, I've I've had some times in my life where I was under certain stresses, and you know, you just feel it physically. You just don't feel that great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, Doc, you, you were talking about, just going back to the initial evaluation, dental health, and and what. How is that? That, that? that fascinates me. Like when you're saying dental health can affect your general health, how is that? Well, I mean, they most people probably know this, but our mouth is what we call the dirtiest part of our body, right? So there's loads and loads of bacteria in there. Um, we want to make sure people have good oral health. Keep in mind that your oral bacteria is something that you swallow every time you swallow any food. So if we don't have good oral health, then that makes its way into the rest of the digestive system. Your mouth is part of your digestive system. A lot of people have uh, chronic infections in their gums and in their in their mouth that they're completely unaware of. So if we're suspecting that with a patient, then we actually send them to a biological dentist who does a DNA analysis of their oral cavity. And by doing that, what we're able to do is we're able to identify, is there a chronic infection in, in the mouth? And this could be a stealth infection for a lot of people that's creating this chronic immune and inflammatory uh, response. A lot of people have dental work, uh, which in which they have amalgam fillings put into their mouths. And so right. that could be a source of mercury toxicity. Some people have, you know, uh, crowns and stuff like that put in. Um, and, and root canals, which could be also a source of uh, chronic infection and chronic inflammation. So the mouth is, is a very, very um, important part of the body to evaluate. And it's, it's right there. It's very readily available to us to assess and analyze. We don't have to cut people open to see what's going on in their mouth. We don't have to do fancy scans or anything. 
Uh, most people have quite extensive dental histories. And another thing to make a note of is if somebody has a lot of crowding, uh, crowding of the of the lower jaw, especially is an indication of malnutrition, especially as a child. So you're seeing loads and loads of people, especially young children these days with braces. And lots, lots of kids have t are having to have their teeth pulled because their jaws can't support the number of teeth that they have. And that's usually a sign of micronutrient deficiencies that start wow. in childhood. And another thing to note is like, if you look at children, if you look at uh, the first, second, third children in families, usually the third child has the most overcrowding because the mom at that point is so nutrient depleted and the child is so nutrient depleted that usually the third child needs more dental work than anyone else. Wow, that is crazy. You, you do hear that, like you hear with gum disease, it affects heart disease. That's probably the the most common thing. I did. I just read an article though on root canals, and that um, this. I don't know if this is true, not true. Maybe you can clarify this for me. But they said there was a doctor about a hundred years ago that did research on root canals and felt that when you remove the root, it's impossible to then sterilize the cavity underneath it, even though it's closed in and that you get these stealth infections. Is that is that true? Yeah, we see that uh, in countless patients. It's better to remove the tooth than it is to have the root canal because wow. once, once, you, once you take out uh, the nervous system component, which is what you're doing when you get a root canal done, you're, you're taking all that feedback away, right? And so you can have a problem there and, and, and most likely never even know it's a problem. So it's important that you know if you're going to work with a dentist, I always suggest that you work with a biological dentist, somebody who's going to use the latest technology and somebody who's going to help you uh, navigate the. I'm not a dentist, so I don't want to get too too deep into this, but you know, uh, you know, I I would suggest that people connect with a with a biological dentist, and you can go to www.iaomt.org and find somebody who can work with you in that capacity. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that, Doc. That's just, I just read an article on that. I was just fascinated about it. But now let me, just, so we talked a little bit about uh, environmental factors affecting your health. In this day and age, what are the most common environmental factors and what are the most common nutritional factors that you see affecting us? Well, you know, one of the most common things that we see is vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D deficiency has become rampant partly because of our you know, hysteria that's been created around the sun, you know, for the last like 20 years, the uh, medical associations and dermatological associations and people who sell us poisonous sunscreens have been telling us to avoid the sun. And the sun is the reason that there's life on this planet. You know, without the sun, there's no food, there's really no ecosystem. And we've been convinced to avoid it. And then you're seeing people with you know, just debilitatingly low levels of vitamin D. Now, what happens that I see quite often is people test low for vitamin D and their doctor gives them vitamin D and their vitamin D levels come back up on blood results, but that patient doesn't always feel better. Because when you have low vitamin D, you don't just have low vitamin D, you actually have a sunshine deficiency. And when you have a sunshine deficiency, it means you have a fresh air deficiency. It means you have a nature deficiency. It means you probably aren't walking because you're sitting at your desk. So you're toxic with sitting too much. You're toxic with stress because you're probably trying to meet a deadline. So there's, you know, you have, we have to look at this uh, more than just myopically. We have to look at the big picture. So if somebody's low in vitamin D, they're not low in the vitamin D that sits on a, on a supplement shelf. They're low in sunlight. And so sunlight helps us regulate our circadian rhythm, which circadian rhythm is basically our biological clock. Uh, it helps us regulate our sleep. It regulates our serotonin production. Serotonin is the hormone or neurotransmitter rather that makes us feel good. We need serotonin for uh, happiness, but we also need serotonin for bowel motility to keep our bowels moving. We also need serotonin for uh, muscle production. So serotonin is the rate limiting um, well, tryptophan, I'm sorry, which helps make serotonin is the rate limiting amino acid for muscle growth and uh, muscle building. Uh, we also need to be outside because it helps us stay grounded. Grounding helps us dissipate uh, electrons and recharges our battery. You know, the human, a human being is a battery. The other thing that happens when we're in the sun uh, is we create something called vasodilation. Vasodilation increases blood flow uh, to the surface of the skin. And this is a common and growing issue. So literally when you get outside in the sun, you increase something called sulfation. Sulfation causes dilation of the blood cap micro capillaries in our body. When we get this uh, systemic micro, uh, microvasculature dilation that takes place, our brain starts working better. We start sending more healing energy 
and nutrient delivery to all parts of our body. And a lot of chronic illnesses, even if you're eating healthy, may stem from poor circulation to the actual tissue because you could have perfectly nourishing blood because you're taking the right vitamins and you're eating the right foods. But if you don't have circulation, then none of that really matters. So the sun is, is extremely powerful. And, and it's important to work with a practitioner that looks at the big picture, not somebody who's going to take your lifestyle deficiencies and simply supplement them away and have a myopic viewpoint. Because here's the thing, we can't measure everything. And if you can't measure everything, then you're not measuring anything. So we have to look at lifestyle very closely and examine that so that we can really tap into nature's healing ability. And, you know, nature is how, you know, we are part of nature. So the more we remove ourselves from nature, the more uh, unwell and sick will all be. And it should be no surprise to people who are sitting indoors in toxic light, you know, we constant exposure to blue light. So our body has no way of regulating what time of day it is. This is why people have sleep related issues. People are sitting way too much. They're staring at a screen. So they're screwing up their eyes as well because they're focused on a single distance. Uh, it's also important uh, to recognize that we don't get proper lymphatic drainage. So our lymphatic system is our body's sewage system. Every cell in our body is surrounded by three things. It's surrounded by a blood vessel, it's surrounded by a nerve, and it's surrounded by lymphatic um, vessels. And lymphatic vessels basically drain the waste products that are produced in our body. We have about five liters of blood in our body. We have 12 liters of lymph that are produced every single day. So we, produce, mm. we as human beings, produce a lot of waste. And the way that waste is, is basically, um, you know, pushed through our body is by our muscles contracting. It's not our heart that pumps this system. It's our muscles contracting that pumps this system. And I recognize, you know, some people got to sit, you know, that's part of their job. And and you know, getting up periodically is gonna be helpful. Some people who have to sit for prolonged periods of time, they can wear compression stockings. That could be helpful because that at least gets some of the lymphatic system uh, fluids that are produced draining. But another good tool is a rebounder. So a rebounder, you know, first thing in the morning and before you go to bed at night or when you get home from work, just two to three minutes, just put on your favorite song and, and jump up and down on, the, on a mini trampoline and that can get the lymphatic system uh, you know, moving as well. So. There's a lot you know, Dr. Phil, I have a patient, and it's funny you're saying that. We were just handling this, who uh, severe, like severe lymph problems, right? She has uh, the edema on her legs. You know, we've sent her out for vascular evaluation and cardiac evaluation. It's pretty much a lymph problem. But then, you, you know, they have these lymphatic pumps, um, and they work temporarily. But um, how, how would you recommend treating somebody like that? And is some of that also nutritional? <laughs> Well, one of the things that I do, what I would suggest to somebody like that is, you know, the compression stockings can obviously help. Uh, you have vibrational plates, which can also be very beneficial. These are plates that vibrate, they uh, shake up the whole body, which is another good thing. Um, getting her on a rebounder can be something good and starting off slow, you know, maybe 20, 30 seconds and then working her way up. Dry brushing is another way to promote healthy lymphatic um, drainage, lymphatic massage. Uh, can be something good, but I would also recommend a plant-based diet. So for her, I would probably recommend anywhere from 10 to 30 days of going on a, a low protein or no protein diet where she's primarily eating uh, mostly fruits and vegetables. And this will clear out the lymph uh, system. A lot of lymph is waste products and you know, um, a high fat, high protein diet for some people can be very problematic because it requires a lot of energy to digest proteins and turn them into amino acids and fats are very nutrient dense, which means they can, they can sometimes require a lot of energy and people with chronic illness usually have sluggish, they always have sluggish or poor digestion. So the more we can introduce live whole foods into this person, the more their lymphatic system is going to, it's going to start cleansing itself. Keep in mind your lymphatic system cleanses your blood. So the cleaner we can have somebody eating and the better we can have them digesting their meals, the better their overall health is going to be. Dr. Patel, what a wonderful interview. I, I tell you, you're awesome. Um, let me ask you, you know, towards the end of our interviews, we always ask uh, our, our guests what they think the holy grail of health is. And I'm going to pose that question to you, sir. What, is, what do you believe the holy grail of health to be? Well, I, I would say it's two things. Um, it's community and self-love. So I recently spoke in Guernsey at an event called, and Guernsey is a country in the English Channel. It's, it's about to be named a blue zone. And they're trying to become the longest living country on the planet, which they'll probably do in the next 10 to 15 years. And so I spoke there and I had other guest speakers that I was surrounded with that spoke there. And the consensus was 
that in every blue zone, and for those of you who don't know, blue zones are where people live to be 100 longer than average. They have a high percentage of centenarians. The key was community. There wasn't a common diet. There wasn't a common environment. You know, the commonality amongst all these people were the community and a sense of purpose. And, you know, that's missing these days. You know, we have online communities. We have, you know, uh, all these things, uh, digital communities, if you will. But that human connection is something that's missing these days. And the more we can connect with who we feel is our tribe in person and as frequently as possible, the better our health with, will be. And in order for us to do that, it start, starts by loving ourselves. It starts by not making excuses at every turn when it comes to our health. So you have to love yourself if you plan on being healthy in the first place. And so I would say that community and self-love are the holy grails of, uh, of health. And, and really, those two things lead to happiness. So anything that you can do that increases your levels of, of happiness is going to increase your uh, life expectancy. But, you know, there's no sense in increasing life expectancy unless you're truly happy uh, to begin with. Dr. Patel, wonderful interview. So people that want to learn more about you, want to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, there's a few ways. Uh, what I'll encourage people to do is uh, sign up in our Facebook community. Uh, you can go to lpicommunity.com and that'll take you directly to our Facebook community. We've got almost 3,000 people there and we sh that's a safe place for you to ask questions. For you, You'll feel very welcome there. It's a safe place for you to share ideas and, uh, and we do weekly Q&As there. Another thing that you can do is if you're interested in going through what we call the Living Proof Experience, where you can get that first appointment and come in and we can evaluate you. We do work with people remotely. Then you can go to IamProof.com. And then the third thing that you can do is you can simply go to a 30-day program that we've set up called 30 and 30. And if you go to www.30in30.org, so 30in30.org, I've created a, a free 30-day program and it basically shares my best self-care tips so that we can keep you out of our office. But then if you do need us, then we're always available and, and happy and ready to help you. Dr. Sasha Patel, thank you, sir, for being on the show. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for helping me spread the message. And thank you for everything that you're doing, Dan. Our pleasure. This episode is sponsored by New Jersey Foot and Ankle Center in Orido, New Jersey. Remember, when you have a foot problem, you've got a foot doctor in the family. Weekend and evening appointments are available. Call us at 201-261-9445. Once again, that's 201-261-9445. Thanks for listening. Check out the show notes over at drdanspeaks.com. If you're loving the show, head over to iTunes and leave us a review, and we'll catch you next time.